I have one other duty, and that is the great pleasure to introduce uh, this morning's keynote speaker. And that keynote speaker is Vice Admiral Mark Norman, who is the commander of the Royal Canadian Navy. In fact, he's the 34th commander of the Royal Canadian Navy. He assumed command a uh, li little over a year ago, but June of last year. And at this juncture, in his during his command, Canada is undergoing one of the most ambitious and biggest revitalization of its Navy, with a huge, by Canadian standards, ship building program, which will be critical to the future of this country and to Canada's Navy. And Admiral Norman is the right man for the job. Please join me in welcoming Vice Admiral Mark Norman. I always get nervous when Admiral Buck introduces me. Um, it, uh, you know, we're all products uh, of our experiences, uh, our environment, and the Navy, the Royal Canadian Navy, as I'm sure it's true of every other Navy here, it's a small organization. Uh, it's a very tight family uh, in many respects, and so when I uh, when I'm introduced by somebody for which I have so much respect. It, it really is quite humbling. And I look out in the audience this morning and I see uh, many uh, other of my predecessors and other uh, senior retired Canadian officers who had a significant, generally positive, some not so much, uh, impact uh, on my career and my development. And I, I stand here um, as a product of that that mentoring of that leadership uh, and of that, uh, that stewardship of an institution that uh, is really quite something. And I look out as well and see a bunch of younger faces um, who uh, hopefully will be as inspired as I was um, when I got to participate in these types of things and uh, listen to the discussions that will affect not just our future, but more importantly, their future. And uh, that's really what we're here to talk about in many respects. I have the, the great privilege and, and responsibility to try and provide some perspective on why uh, not only this conference itself, but why the, dis the, the issues that are going to be discussed here would be important for Canada and for all of us, uh, no matter what country we're representing. I'll be working from uh, prepared notes, which is something that I have to do more and more these days as I joke in these, uh, in these forums. Um, for some reason, people are starting to pay attention to things I say. Uh, that was never really the case uh, early in my career. Um, but uh, so I, I don't apologize for that. The good news is that it will hopefully keep me on track. And I, I then ask for your indulgence as we go through um, the next few minutes. Your Excellencies, uh, parliamentarians, fellow flag officers, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome to Victoria, home of Canada's Pacific Fleet. It's great to see you here at a venue that's built a reputation for meaningful dialogue on those maritime strategic issues that really matter to us and the countries we represent. Let me begin by thanking our hosts who have already been identified this morning, but in particular the Navy League of Canada, the Asia Pacific Centre for Security Studies, and of course Rear Admiral Bill Trulove and his team for putting this conference together. I wish to also uh, share in acknowledging the significant contribution of all of the corporate sponsors without whom whose support this morning and for the next couple of days this, this would not be possible. My aim is to provide you with a Canadian perspective on the issues you'll be exploring in depth over the next couple of days by setting out what, why the Asia Pacific matters to the Royal Canadian Navy and spelling out a few of the things that the RCN is doing about it. Before I do so, let me give you a snapshot of where we see ourselves in the RCN today as we continue advancing through a period of unprecedented peacetime renewal, beginning with the ongoing modernization of our 12 Halifax-class frigates. The project is firmly on track to complete on time and on budget thanks to an innovative governance framework 
and trust-enabled relationships that the Crown entered into with its corporate, corporate partners, many of whom are here in this room this morning. Three other major projects are moving steadily through the machinery of government procurement, even as that machinery is being retooled to capitalize upon and reinforce key Canadian industrial strengths and competencies. First, the recently named Harry DeWolf class of Arctic offshore patrol ships, which will enable us to become a truly Arctic rather than just Northern Navy. With the capability to operate in the Canadian Arctic archipelago on a sustained and persistent basis. The Queenston class joint support ship to replace our underway replenishment ships, protector and preserver, soon to be paid off as was announced just a couple of weeks ago. And finally, the Canadian surface combatant, in essence the jewel in the crown, to replace the Iroquois class destroyers that we have also begun to retire from active service and eventually the modernized frigates themselves as the combat platforms that will carry the RCN into the middle decades of this century, capable not only of decisive action at sea, but also, hopefully, able to contribute to decisive joint action ashore. These three programs, along with the Royal Canadian Air Force's impressive modernized Aurora Maritime Patrol aircraft and the new Cyclone Maritime helicopter that will, will soon be integrating into fleet service, along with the full operationalization of our Victoria-class submarines before this year is finished, together make up the most comprehensive period of peacetime fleet renewal since the Royal Canadian Navy came into being in 1910. Over that 104-year history, the RCN has undergone several significant evolutions, and what we're experiencing today is just the latest in a series. Although the focus, understandably, is on new ships, we're also looking inside the guardrails of our institution. By investing in ourselves through our organization and our culture, we're enabling what will be two to three decades of continuous transition. One Navy is the description of our efforts in this regard. It's not just a slogan, but a new way of doing business. This is all to say that the renewal of the RCN is not necessarily just about new ships, but it's also about the men and women who will sail them into the future. But have no doubt that we're going to need those new ships and those new capabilities, because as this audience already understands full well, the world's oceans have never been more important to our collective security and prosperity than they are today, as ocean politics continue to intensify in this 21st century, and perhaps nowhere more dramatically than in Asia Pacific. So why does Asia Pacific matter to the RCN and to Canada? In answering this question, I'll ask you to accept how we, as a fighting service, have distilled the three defense tasks and six military missions assigned to us by the Government of Canada into the following statement of fundamental purpose. The RCN defends the global system at sea and from the sea. Over the past 25 years, what really mattered from this global system perspective was stability in the greater Middle East in relation to the need to assure undisrupted access to the world's most crucial commodity, oil, almost all of which had to pass through a number of regional maritime choke points that were vulnerable to actions of regional powers. Even if none of those powers could hope to prevail for long against American sea power and the supporting sea power of its closest partners and allies. Over the last century, the RCN has played a significant role, correction, over the last quarter century, the RCN has played a significant role in bringing stability to this region, deploying repeatedly into this crucial maritime crossroad to restore peace following the invasion of Kuwait, to enforce a series of United Nations sanctions and embargoes against Iraq, to provide sea combat protection to U.S. expeditionary and striking forces projecting power into Afghanistan in the aftermath of the attacks of 9-11, as well as to escort American carriers providing air support to that campaign, to exercise operational level command of the regional maritime counter-terrorist effort during the second Gulf War, 
and more recently to contribute to regional maritime security in ensuring the safety of maritime commerce in the face of piracy at sea and disrupting of narco-trafficking supply chains of regional terrorist organizations. Over that same period, the Asia-Pacific was a place through which the RCN sailed, with the expectation of those periodic deployments to the Western Pacific, which we conducted expressly to sustain our most important regional Navy-to-Navy -Navy relationships. Over that same period, the RCN participated in only one named operation in Southwest Asia, and that was to contribute to the Australian-led effort to restore stability in East Timor in 1999. Looking ahead then to the next 25 years, few would suggest that the greater Middle East is likely to become a more settled region. Moreover, the Indian Ocean is likely to become increasingly important to all of us in geopolitical terms as relationships amongst the world's principal military, economic, and maritime powers continue to evolve, and perhaps dramatically so. However, from the global system perspective, the next 25 years are likely to be shaped profoundly by events in the Asia Pacific. And it's important to note that it really doesn't have to do with the explosive growth of regional maritime commerce, per se, as some observers might argue. It has everything to do with the relationship between dominant sea power and the workings of the global system itself. And more specifically, how the relationship between China and the United States is evolving around classic issues of sea power. When viewed through the lens of global system defense, I would argue that Asia Pacific's numerous and apparently intractable maritime disputes are of concern to all of us because they could eventually place at risk the del delicate balance struck in the Law of the Sea Convention between a coastal state's right to regulate its ocean approaches and the international community's right of free movement and access through the ocean commons upon which the global economy literally floats. In this vein, the increasing and frequently conflicting claims in the South China Sea represent unusually expansive interpretations of the 1982 United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, but they are by no means unique. This may simply be a signal to the international community that a new balance is emerging in the global maritime order. However, it could also signal something in the global maritime a correction. It could also signal something more profound should the consensus that sustains the 1982 convention begin to unravel, placing at risk the relative stability in ocean politics that the convention achieved over 25 years ago. This unraveling of the extant maritime order happened at least twice before during periods when, like today, major shifts in global power and economic influence were happening. The first such instance occurred in the 17th century when the Dutch and English went to war on three occasions to determine how the world's oceans would be regulated. Ironically, although the English eventually emerged from that nearly century-long struggle as the dominant maritime power, it was the Dutch legal tradition of mare liberum the idea that the seas cannot be made sovereign and hence are free for all to use that prevailed because it was better matched to England's growing mer mercantile interests than the more than the mare clausum doctrine of sea control that England had previously defended. The idea that the seas can be made sovereign to the limits of effective state control. The second such instance occurred in the latter half of the 20th century, when the retreat of European colonialism created a host of new coastal states whose maritime interests could easily have come into conflict with those of traditional maritime powers. But they didn't due to one remarkable fact, that the international community chose to reconcile the competing legal traditions of mare clausum and mare liberum through consultation and cooperation and not through conflict. 
because no one then saw instability in the maritime domain as serving their national interests. The result was arguably the most successful international treaty ever conceived, the 1982 Convention or UNCLOSE, which effectively permitted the world's coastal states to enclose a vast majority of the world's ocean resources, but without prejudice to traditional freedoms of navigation that are of vital interest to maritime nations. It remains to be seen whether or not the international consensus that be lies behind UNCLOSE will continue to hold in the face of what may become existential pressures upon many states, both large and small. But there are few questions of greater importance to us all, and they lie clearly at the heart of Sino-American relationships. In examining this relationship, many observers have drawn tempting parallels with the Anglo-Germanic relationship prior to the First World War during the previous era of globalization. But as Margaret Macmillan concluded in her history, quote, the war that ended peace, unquote, no outcomes are preordained. And we can all take great encouragement from the fact that Chinese and American naval leaders, some of them are in this room today, are finding ways to cooperate strategically wherever they can. That is why the Asia Pacific matters to us all gathered here today, and not merely to the states of the specific region. So what's the RCN doing about it? Well, first, as this conference demonstrates, we're paying attention to this uniquely maritime theater. As we have perhaps more closely and for longer than any other national institution of which I'm aware. And that's important because you can't surge strategic insight and understanding unless you've been paying attention and develop solid relationships with people living in the neighborhood. That's among the many good reasons we became full members of the Western Pacific Naval Symposium in 2010 in support of a more comprehensive approach the Canadian Armed Forces have recently adopted towards defense diplomacy that we're calling our global engagement strategy. That strategy recognizes the RCN's participation in WPNS our Navy to Navy staff talks with the United States, Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, and Chile, and the bilateral exchanges we conduct and collective education opportunities we're pursuing, as well as the principal exercises we undertake in the region. In this vein, the exercise of the Rim of the Pacific, or RIMPAC, has now become one of Canada's two most important joint and combined exercises undertaken by the Canadian Armed Forces. Second, as a result of significant redistribution of our floating assets that was begun shortly after the end of the Cold War, the RCN's two coastal formations are now contributing equally to achieve strategic effect for Canada on a global basis, a fact that I remind people by telling them it's not really important where our ships are based, what really matters is where they're at, as the NUFs would say. And getting ships and submarines where they're needed before stuff happens, or even to prevent stuff from happening, is what navies are all about. Admittedly, this has proven to be a major challenge for the RCN as we pursue the fleet's ongoing renewal. But our bent strength will soon be much better than it is today, and with our submarines on the threshold of achieving steady state, and our first modernized frigate due to be ready for operational deployment both before the end of this year. Thirdly, I've challenged the staff to find ways to sustain higher levels of forward deployed presence of our frigates in particular, as well as our Victoria class submarines in areas of strategic interest to the government, including Asia Pacific. Overcoming the tyranny of distance is no small matter for any Navy, especially one as modest as Canada's especially considering the significant responsibilities we retain for domestic tasks in Canada's three ocean estate. Part of the solution for the RCN will be found in the delivery of the to Wolf class that I mentioned earlier, which will allow us to meet a wide range of domestic and continental maritime security tasks with these ships when they begin to arrive on the waterfront less than four years from now. Other parts of the solution have already been identified and the lessons we've learned 
in adapting crewing practices to maximize the utility of every bunk at sea during this important renewal period that we're seeing today. Fourth, there are certain capabilities and competencies we own that make sense to decouple from our platforms and make them deployable or employable in their own right, especially in support of regional capacity building. Here I refer, as an example, to our world-class naval boarding parties, which we plan to evolve towards the next tier of a desired expeditionary capability. Fifth, I believe time has come to accept the logic that a globally deployable Navy of Canada's size needs to rotate its ship's companies more often than it rotates its ships. By drawing on the lessons we've learned recently from our own experiences, as well as from those of our allies, many of whom are in the room today, we need to fully understand the implications involved in keeping major combatants forward deployed for significant periods of their operational cycle, taking a measured approach that allows us to invest sensibly in the reach and capacity of our technical and logistics branches, as well as to establish supporting arrangements with our closest regional partners. In closing, ladies and gentlemen, permit me again to extend my welcome to this 2014 iteration of the Maritime Security Challenges Conference. I wish to thank all of you for choosing to be here, and I look forward to a very stimulating and rewarding series of discussions. Thank you, et merci. I, I just checked my watch because I'm always mindful of not speaking too long, and Dr. Jim, if you would indulge me, I won't be able to participate in many of the panel discussions, so I thought with some risk uh, that I might provide an opportunity for a few questions if you'd like to ask me some questions. There's only one rule, or a couple actually, you can ask any question you want, I get to decide if I'm going to answer or not. Um, and uh, I know this is breaking from the format, but I'd like to at least have an opportunity to participate with you before I go on and do some other business. So would anybody like me to ask me a question? Anyone? Anyone? Going once? You're not prepared for this, are you? I can't see because the lights are too bright, but I think it's back here. Yeah, please make your way to the microphone and thank you. Morning, Admiral. Um, is this on? Yeah. Uh, Dave Paglazi, Ottawa Citizen. I was wondering if you Dave. could expand a little on um, the expeditionary capability of the boarding parties. Uh, give us a little more uh, detail on that. Thank yeah, you. so thanks, Dave. The, um, the boarding party has several components to it. I mean, of course, the traditional piece that people see is, is the actual boarding and inspection and security elements of it. But there are other aspects of the team that there's technical aspects of it, there's engineering components. And what we're looking at is a couple of things. We're looking at how we can create a more standing organization that removes the burden from individual ships, companies, to uh, generate and sustain a level of competency that is now uh, increasingly demanding. Uh, we've been doing a great job. We have great folks doing this, but we're always cycling them through. And so we'd like to create a more standing organization that there'll be a residual capability in every ship, but in essence we would, we would embark a more robust capability into deployed ships. And as well, the second part is that um, we look at some of the skill sets that uh, we have within our Navy, and other navies have them as well, it's not just us, but that we think are exportable, uh, and that speaks to a lot of the um, technical side of things, some, some training capability. And so you've got sort of the pointy end boarding side of it, and then if you imagined um, deployable uh, capacity building teams uh, of, of different types, uh, that would be the second element. And so we're sort of moving those two ideas uh, down the track simultaneously. We're hoping to uh, sort of lean into the, the restructuring of this uh, in, a, in a fairly significant way in uh, 2015. Does that, hope, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Professor Emerson, did you have a question? Uh, perhaps you could use the mic, please. Thank you. Yeah, I thought 
I thought your comparison of the closed and open seas was spot on, and it raised the obvious question of, from your point of view, what do you think would be the preferred solution for reconciling those two alternative ways of looking at the world? I have enough problems dealing with my own challenges inside the guardrails uh, of, of the business that I'm running on behalf of, of all of you. I, I really wouldn't want to suggest, my, my only answer would be, and it was buried in the text, that I think the way forward is, is to embrace what we have that works for us, an unprecedented arrangement and agreement uh, amongst maritime nations and to work within not only the rules but the spirit of, of that um, convention. And uh, we see many examples of that um, all around the world in, in there are positives. There are great best practices being applied um, by uh, um, regional uh, navies. There are great best practices being applied amongst neighbors and they have not only a bilateral but multilateral and then ultimately a regional um, impact. We had a similar discussion just a few weeks ago at the International Sea Power Symposium and it was, I, I had the privilege on behalf of Admiral Greenert to lead one of the panels. It was on the environment and climate change but fundamentally one of the issues that came out of it as it was the last panel of, of the symposium was that notwithstanding the disparate regional challenges that many different navies are facing, um, there, were, there were some really compelling common elements. And one of them was that um, the importance of having solid and cooperative relations with your closest neighbors and to be able to work through those issues in a professional and almost collegial way. And, and there are examples of that in um, the Gulf of Guinea today, there are examples of that in South America today, there are examples of that in Asia Pacific today, and believe it or not, there are examples of that in North America today, when there's only two countries playing in that space. Um, and we do, we, we do have, I think, a very good track record collectively as a global community of working through those issues um, in, a, in a cooperative way. So that, that would be the best answer I can give you. Um, any other questions? I one more, I guess, and then in the back there, sir. Good morning, Admiral. I'm Jim Murdoch, uh, just retired from the U.S. Navy and now working with uh, Lockheed Martin. I was uh, very appreciative of your remarks and thoughtful about the concept of rotational crewing. What can we in industry do to help you meet the challenge of getting that replacement crew trained and certified and ready to go forward to uh, take over the take over the vessel. Thank you. Yeah, no, it, it's a great question. Um, and I, I think in a, in a very simplistic way, I would say that we need to take a more systems approach to how we develop um, solutions going forward. Uh, we, and, and everybody plays. It's not just industry and it's not just the customer at the end of the day. It's also everybody who involved in the process. And believe me, there's lots of people involved in the process. The good news is everybody's trying to help. The bad news is everybody's trying to help. Um, the, um, the, the short answer is that um, as we look forward and we develop, you know, not only the, the, let's talk about a ship or all the systems and subsystems in the ship, and we look at the crewing of that ship, um, we need to look deeper into how we're going to generate the competencies necessary on, a, on an ongoing basis. We're getting better at that. I think everybody has evolved and we tend to take a very um, bifurcated approach to capability um, delivery where we'd buy the stuff and then we'd worry about how we're going to put the people in the stuff. Um, and now um, it's a completely integrated solution space and there's a lot of trade space in there but um, uh, philosophically this is about looking at the whole thing as a system looking at the output um, of what you want that system to be able to do more so than focusing on the inputs to the system, which is what we traditionally tend to do. We tend to be myopic in looking at 
the, the numbers, the, the, the dollars, the, the ships, the kit, the P, even the crewing itself, and not necessarily looking at it as a, as a complete system of, of systems. So that would be the best answer I could give you in that regard. Now, with that said, the challenge is convincing people that that is a, um, an acceptable way to go forward because it doesn't necessarily lend itself to some of the restrictive programmatic constraints that are imposed um, by governments going forward because those programmatic constraints tend to be more 20th century in their approach as opposed to what I'm trying to describe as a, a 21st century solution to 21st century problems.